And then I'll do that. And then I'll do that. Tim, it looks like you got less makeup on this week. Well, let's just say Mary Kay hadn't come by to, to restock my supplies. So, <laughs> okay. So here we go, week two of this. Uh, I'm so glad you all came back. I was a little concerned last week whether anybody went. <laughs> it's uh, it was it, it was it was a tough read last week um, as we hear about what God has told Micah he was going to do um, with the people and how severe that was. Um, let's just do a little regroup. Um, we started with an outline of Micah and showed that there's these three cycles of where God explains his judgment, but he always offers hope. There's always, there's always his desire to reconcile us to himself. There's always his desire um, for, to have a future. There's always his desire um, to be Emmanuel, to be with us. Uh, and that, that is stronger than the judgment that he, that he must do. Uh, the first was against the nations, both Israel and Judah. Um, and it's severe. And we, where we left off was God had laid out what he had willed to do. Um, and we'll finish uh, this section, this first uh, part of the outline, with how the people would respond or how the people should respond to that. Um, and we know, uh, Harry raised this last week, and I know Nancy has said this several other times, uh, Micah 6, 8, you know, what, is, what does God expect us to do? Well, we're, we're expected to do justice and love mercy and walk humbly. Um, and the people were not doing that. That's why they're subject to just, uh, justice. Um, but does God expect us to do that if he's not willing to do it himself? Well, I think he's done it several times. I mean, through Jesus is one time. Mm -hmm. But, you know, even when he walked through the Garden of Eden with Adam and Eve, I mean, you really have to humble yourself to do that. To walk as an eagle, man. Right. 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 He's certainly done that part. What about the justice part? Does God do justice? Oh, yes. <laughs> yeah. And we read that. And, and, and you know, we, we, have, we have, you know, post-cross sentimentality and it's like wow that is so harsh that is so severe but that's what we would expect if someone harmed us we would expect someone to right that wrong we would expect punishment to be done and so god is a just god and we don't like often the judgment or the justice that befalls us but he is a just god and so he does what he asks us to do and of course he shows mercy repeatedly uh, we'll read it here. And we know it in our own life. Um, and he wants us to be that image of him. He wants us to be just and he wants us to love mercy. And he wants us to walk humbly. And when, we're, and we, when we do injustice and we're not merciful and we're proud, that's so against his nature that he, he disciplines us. Um, and so that I wanted to pull that out because this is this is a tough read for me when I when I read this stuff. I got to remind myself that it's not undeserved, uh, and he always his ultimate desire is always to bring us back. It's always to restore us. But I think his justice has changed uh, from the Old Testament to the New. Uh, you know when they were stoning the woman and Jesus said, let him without sin cast the first stone. But before that, that was considered justice. Yeah. Well, it's what's deserved, but grace is the, uh, is the post cross response to that. Right. Um, because grace is, is undeserved. And that's, that's the, that's what Jesus has done for us. It's, it's the undeserved it's still just, there's still a price paid for it. It's just Jesus pays the price, not us. Um. Well, and the stoning people was a way that humans devised as punishment. God didn't 
specifically say he's still the same god as he was 5000 years ago and he still expects us to live according to his word that hasn't changed but human justice and the way it's meted out has changed and since jesus came our punishment has become more gentle and loving and kind so we don't stone the widow but that because of Jesus's love entering the world it has nothing to do with God and his expectations of righteousness. That's a good point. It's a much better answer. So Abigail's going to leave the class next week. I <laughs> uh, keep trying to point it off. Um, okay, well, let's, let's get started with the reading and uh, I'll start with the lookers. Well, we've got to get close enough to read it. <laughs> do not prophesy, their prophets say. Do not prophesy about these things. Disgrace will not overtake us. You descendants of Jacob, should it be said, does the Lord become impatient? Does, does he do such things? I'm not sure I'm getting it all. Do not, do not my words do good to the one whose ways are upright yeah, let's, let's recap, re recap the verses before where it's talking about this judgment and then there's this mocking people will be mocked because the gods you know the, the god of israel isn't strong enough to you know to fight back the assyrians and the the, the, the people of, of israel and judah are mocked um and then there's this thing uh, do not prophesy and when i read this it sounds to me a lot like the garden. Does the Lord become impatient? Does he do those things? No. That prophecy can't be true. It, it, it can't be right that God will judge us that way. And it's that so, whole deception of not understanding who God is uh, and that he expects righteousness. And we go on. We'll go on with this. Uh, this is um, Cindy. Lately, my people have risen up like an enemy. You strip off the rich robe from those who pass by without a care, like men returning from battle. You drive the women of my people from their pleasant homes. You take away my blessing from their children forever. If you remember in the video, um, what was happening is uh, the injustice of, of taking people's property away, of, of taking, taking something from someone without, you know, uh, uh, what do you call it, due process without, you know, a, a, against the law, against what the Torah said. And that's what was happening. Um, and then uh, Chris or Harry. Get up, go away, for this is not your resting place because it is defiled. It is ruined beyond all remedy. If a liar and a deceiver comes and says, I will prophesy for you plenty of wine and beer, that would be just the profit for these people. I never knew they had beer back then. <laughs> well, it's, uh, I think Ben Franklin said that's proof that, uh, that uh, God loves us, right? <laughs> Something like that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, this is, when, when, when you're, in, you're in this state of rebellion, when you're in this state of injustice, when you're in this state of uncivility, there's also this de deception that, uh, you know, I I'll tell you what you want to hear. You don't have to worry about the consequences that are coming. I I'll tell you what you want to hear. You know, G give me a little coin. I'll, I'll give you the right answer, the answer you're looking for. Um, okay, let's, let's continue. This is uh, uh, Lori. I don't see anything. Yeah, oh, that's be that's because there's nothing to read. Hang on. To that. <laughs> I can read first cycle. <laughs> <laughs> okay, you're good. Well, we'll come back to you later. Um, okay. Yeah. So this that that concludes the the judgment. If we went through it, it's it's you know loss of property, loss of fellowship, loss of children, the mocking. Then you're going to have um, you know this this false prophets, and then finally you're going to have this exile. All of those is is part of the judgment. Um. 
So what were the things in the, in the judgment that bothered God the most? Pride. Yeah, pride was the big one. But other things came along with that. What were they? Arrogance. The way the leaders treated the people. Yeah. They did it. They wanted bribes and gifts for things that they did. Yeah. Yeah. They weren't being fair. Those with power, the leaders being the, the ones that were identified, those with power abused that power and they took advantage of others. Uh, so what are the parallels in our world or are there any? Yeah. That, that's a scoff of, yes, there are. <laughs> Do you want, how long you want this Bible study to go to? As long as, long as you want to talk, Lori. Well, no, let me rephrase that. Oh, um, yeah, you know better than that. <laughs> Do we have pride in our world? Yeah. And arrogance? Yeah. And where do you see it? Most of us don't have to go any further than ourselves. Yeah. <laughs> Hold the mirror up. That's the biggest one. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's something we're all guilty of. Um, what, about, what about how leaders treat people? Where do we see that? How, how, how is that a, a parallel to what's happening here? Well, I think all around the world, the church is being persecuted. Okay. What is the threat to the church that would cause them to be persecuted, you suppose? I'm asking you, Joe. <laughs> if if the church is being persecuted, why why? What is, what is what is it about the church that's causing that persecution? I'm not sure I have the answer for that. Hmm. Well, the leaders don't agree with what the church is doing. I mean, in its basic term. Places like China, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a direct, uh, it, it's a direct parallel because the leaders don't want people to get a taste of Christianity because they, their leaders think they are the God for that country, and they want to be worshipped. They don't want them worshiping other, you know, another God. That's for sure. Well, they certainly, they certainly are going to be, are going to cry out for fair treatment. And they're certainly going to cry out for against mistreatment, um, and that's you know it's one one role of a of the church universal is 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 to be God's blessing to the people, and if you're if the blessing that's being given makes you lose power, makes you lose authority, or makes you lose prestige, it's a threat. And I think that's that's part of that answer. Maybe our confidence and their jealousy towards our confidence. Yeah, they want us to be confident in, in what they're doing. And I, think, I think our view is a little bit longer than that, yeah. But the church is not without blame. Oh, no. Most of the time we've... Yeah. Go ahead, Harry. ...given away our moral authority. Mm -hmm. And there's many instances of that over the last... 1500 years for sure. 
Yeah. yeah. One of the things we've read in this is, is that the people, the nations, were subject to the same judgment as the proud and the powerful. Um, and even though, as Harry says, we're all guilty of that, the, the leadership is what really uh, brings about the, uh, the judgment, what they allow to happen. Um, is that true in our world as well? Yes. <laughs> yes, because if we don't say anything, I mean, it isn't that the whole um, issue with racism, you know, when we see somebody being racist towards another human being and we don't say anything, we're basically condoning it by not standing up for that other person, whether whatever it is, it's bullying, whatever it is. Right, we're essentially guilty of the same thing. Right. Okay. Well, then what should we, we as a people, as the church, what, what should we do? What, what should be our response to this? We should say something, we should stand up. Yes. I should say I I should stand up. I should say something. I statements, not me. We, mm -hmm. me. But that's the hardest thing to do because you don't want to go against the crowd and you don't want to right. cause a conflict. Right. I know there are factories in the world where people work for almost nothing. And we allow that to happen because they're making things for us, which we, which we pay money for, but we have to pay less for it because their countries don't have to pay them that much. Right. That right. occurs in Mexico and uh, a lot of other countries in the world. Yeah, Indonesia. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we all say, oh, it's because, you know, Walmart is cheaper and Amazon's cheaper. But right. in the meantime, all our businesses, our local businesses are going out of business, our mom and pops, because for the sake of buying it cheaper and, and the people that have the poor living conditions, you know, I know I, I the average, average monthly wage in Indonesia is $34 a month. But without those jobs, those people wouldn't have $34 a month. They wouldn't That's have true. anything. And those are not Christian nations. They are not run by biblical laws and rules. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah. And That's I can't afford to shop local. They're too expensive for me and my family. <laughs> Well, and, and that's, and I think China has given us a good example there. Uh, you know, they used to be cheap labor, but now they have such advanced technology that they can produce this stuff much more cheaply because they invested in the modernization of their plants where America didn't. Mm -hmm. All right, we're going to hold this thought because this is, this is one of the themes throughout this whole thing. So we'll, hopefully as we hear more, we'll, we'll think of more, but for time. Uh, so let's get to the more positive aspects of this. And I'm, I'm at uh, the Bradleys. I will surely gather all of you, Jacob. I will surely bring together the remnant of Israel. I will bring them together like sheep in a pen, like a flock in its pasture. The place will throng with people. And then John, if you'll finish this up. <clears throat> the one who breaks open the way will go up before them. They will break through the gate and go out. Their king will pass through before them, the Lord at their head. Yeah, I just, I just love the way this gets all tied together. We, we, we have several images of Jesus. Um, and here it's, I will bring together I will bring them together like sheep in a pen. Um, 
you know, like a flock in a pasture. And then I will lead them as their king. And then those are the, you know, the two enduring images of the work of Jesus, right? the, the good shepherd and the mighty king. And so the, you know, the promise for us that the hope through this judgment will come. Uh, God is right to, to, to judge. Um, you know, we have fallen back. He's, he's right to discipline. But as, as, it, as it says here, I will surely, and we can rely on this promise. I will surely, I will bring it together. I will restore, I will redeem, and I will lead. Um, I think it's just, just, just a powerful uh, reminder that even through hard times and even through judgment, um, our, our God is a merciful God. Our, our God is a, a God who loves us, a God who desires um, to restore us. Okay, so that was the, the first cycle. This, this terrible judgment um, the, that's happening and then you know, this, this promise of restoration, the sure restoration of, of God's people. You know, bring them together like a shepherd, lead them like a king. Uh, we're just gonna jump right into the second cycle um, because it didn't fall out the way I expected to when I timed this out last week. So the first cycle dealt with the judgment of the nations, restored remnant, and the second cycle will deal with justice and the contrast between human corruption and human view of, of uh, justice and the promise of his kingdom, which is true justice, true righteous judging, justice. And so we'll see that in this next cycle. Uh, and this will be, um, John, I left off with you, I think, or maybe I left off, maybe it's Randy. And I said, hear now, O leaders of Jacob, you rulers of the house of Israel, you do not know Jacob. So who's he addressing there? Leaders of Israel. Yeah, yeah. So this is this is really to the leaders and the rulers and the those that have uh, power um, in the nation. So the, the the first part was just to the nation in general, and now it's specifically to the leaders. And we'll see as we go through this that Mike is very specific about who he's targeting and what he's targeting in them. Um, and then why, given the in introduction that we had here of justice in this section, why are the leaders addressed? I would think they set the tone. Yeah. What else did they do? Well, the people look to them as examples of how to behave and what to believe, how to treat mm -hmm. each other. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And what else do they do? How do they enforce the rule? Right. They, they, and oftentimes they make the rules and then they have the enforcement. And it's the enforcement where you can often get into injustice. You know, where, where one crime gets this sentence, another crime very similar gets a much leaner sentence. Why is that? That's not just. There's, 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 you know, that's, that's one of the reasons why they're targeted. Targeted. And they're also they're also the um, the literate you know people that most of the people that the, in the temple don't read and don't write and right. so God's word they have their you know they rely totally on them to interpret what you know or to tell them what God, what God's word says so they can't dispute it when they, you don't know how to when you can't read you can't dispute what's written down and what's not and they should know because they read the word. They, they should know what God wants. They mm -hmm. should know what justice means. They should know what mercy is. They should know that. And when you have that ability and that power of leadership and you don't do that, God says that, you know, that's not right. And the, Jesus talked with the Pharisees. What was the thing he argued about them most? It's their pride. You should know the law. Read the law. What does the law say? You think you understand it, but you don't, you're not approaching it humbly. You're approaching it like, like you write the law. Um, and it's that same idea. That's, that's what Mike is going to try to address here in this section. Uh, this will be Nancy. 
<clears throat> oh, you hate good and love evil. You tear the skin from my people and strip the flesh from their bones. You can eat the flesh of my people after stripping off their skin and breaking their bones. You chop them up like flesh for the cooking pot, like meat in a cauldron. Rather graphic image. But the question is, what character traits do you identify uh, in these leaders of injustice? Cruelty. <laughs> <laughs> cruelty. Yeah, there's, a, there's an element of cruelty there. Yeah, they rip the flesh from, yeah, yeah. What else? Well, my notes say that they were, uh, leaders were consuming the defenseless, taking yeah. all they had and divesting them of their means of making a living. So yeah. um, probably yeah. more figurative of taking everything they had. Right, right. Using them for their own gain. Yes. Uh, the, the video talked about you know, them taking their land, uh, using schemes to take the land, and the land was never to be sold. So that was, that was the lasting inheritance that you know, God gave Jacob. You know, your sons would have this land and, and the land would be a forever inheritance, but they're, they're taking it away so that people would be you know, bereft of any chance of income, anything, and just consuming them as if they're food. Okay, this is um, the lookers again. Then they will cry out to the Lord, but he will not answer them. At that time, he will hide his face from them because of the evil they have done. So what are the consequences of practicing injustice for these leaders? Revolution. <laughs> yeah, that's one, that's one consequence. Yeah. God turns his face from them. Yeah. Yeah. Their, their power is not forever. God, God will respond and God will be just. Um, and they'll call out because it'll seem unfair to them at that time. Mm -hmm. And he won't even hear. Okay, uh, Cindy. This is what the Lord says. As for my prophets who lead my people astray, who proclaim peace while they chew with their teeth, but declare war against one who puts nothing in their mouths. So now it's not just the leaders of the people. Now it's the prophets. Now it's the... Uh, now it's the voice of God to the people. And they're fat, dumb, and happy. They're chewing with their teeth, whereas the people have nothing in their mouths. It's contrast between the powerful and the powerless. Um, yeah, I just said that. And then this is um, the Lefferts. Therefore, a night will come over you without visions and darkness without divination. The sun will set on these prophets and the daylight will turn black over them. Then the seers will be ashamed and the diviners will be disgraced. They will all cover their mouths because there is no answer from God. So these are the people that are speaking for God, the prophets. And what, who's a, what is a prophet that has no knowledge or has no truth or no divine access? False. Yeah, well, false and... and Powerless, they, they have nothing to say. Um, and so it's not only the, you know, the, the rulers of the people, but it's also the, the prophets uh, for the faithful. And if they, um, if they also will lose everything. And when it says that, it kind of reminds me where it says uh, they will be disgraced I think about all these people that predict the end of the world, you know, these prophets, and they say, mm -hmm. oh, it's going to end in six months or two years or whatever. And yeah. uh, that's how I relate to it in today's world. Yeah, yeah. They're just shown to be not understanding at all. Okay, Lori, this one, please. As for me, however, I am filled with power by the spirit of the Lord, with justice and courage to declare to Jacob his transgression and to Israel his sin. Okay, so Michael declares his power and authority. As for me, as for Micah, I am filled with power by the spirit of the Lord, with justice and courage. 
So who in our world's filled with that power? We'd hope we all are. Yeah. Yeah, because, because why? Why do we have that power? Because the Holy Spirit lives in us. Right. Do we have the power in the Spirit of the Lord within us? Yeah. So when you, when, you, when you think about a world that isn't responding to what we think is true, to, to what we think is right, what we think is just, which we think is godly, what power do we have? And then what do we do about that with that power? Well, if we have an established relationship with someone and respect, mutual respect, um, then with the prompting of the Holy Spirit, you could talk to them about something in their life or someone can talk to you that, about something they see in your life mm -hmm. that needs some help. Yeah, right, right there. Declare to Jacob his transgression, point that out to, to bring them back into a right relationship. Yeah. I think he's also telling the raising up the church too. Yeah, yeah. I think we have to recognize we have power to do something about the world. I don't know if we can um, solve everything, but in our sphere, in our ability, in our willingness to be used, I think we can right some wrongs. But first we have to recognize our transgressions. Oh yeah, yeah, get, get, the, get the log out of our own eye before we get the speck, yeah. Um, don't you think sometimes it's hard though that you know you might want to say something but you you aren't the judge are we not going to judge angels i don't know what you mean well isn't that one of the scriptures that we will judge angels so if we can't judge angels then or if we can judge angels, we surely should be able to judge followers among us. I'm talking about people who aren't followers. Yeah, it, this isn't saying anything about, uh, we're not responsible for judging. You know, we're, we're responsible, like, so Micah, in this example, God gave him authority to speak to the people of Jacob, to the land of Jacob. He didn't give him authority to talk to the rest of the world. He didn't give him authority to talk to anybody else. So what Tim was talking about in our sphere, God gives us authority in our sphere, in our relationships, in our, um, like the people we know, the people we interact with. And he, through the Holy Spirit, lets us know when <clears throat> we should intercede and we should. So you're not, you wouldn't be judging that person. You would be alerting that person to some sort of transgression, some sort of thing that needs changed, adjusted, but that's not judging. That's, um, that's just bringing it to their attention. God does, does the judging. You, you, you help them get out of it. So Tim, do you agree with that? Yeah, I think, I think that that is. Okay. You, you have a nephew then who's a niece. Just going to say that he's in your, he, she is in your sphere. But is he, is that person in Tim's sphere though? And I don't know yeah, for sure, say, but it, just because they're related to us doesn't mean they're in our sphere, which sounds crazy. But like in my day to day, my brother and I talk once a year, I have no authority in his life. So I guess like a God would not ask, well, he might ask me, but I don't know that he would ask me to talk to my brother ever. But like all the well, people I interact with here I would so I have I've had students in the past who have asked me questions about situations like that and kids who have graduated and have come back and asked me why I think the way I think and God has allowed me to talk to those people the right way at the right time with the right information um and well if I if I'm waiting to be asked then I'm good with that well I think I you're can waiting work with that be, I think you're also waiting to be prompted by the spirit 
Okay, I can I can work with that. But also Sean, lost here. Yeah, but Sean <laughs> also you've got even though you see your brother once a year, you still have influence in his life because he's part of your he is part of your 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 sphere of influence, even though it's it's you know far away, you still every time you talk to your brother, you have a chance because you do have some kind of relationship with him. And that well, God we'd works like to, that. We'd like to think that, but I'm not sure they, that's the case. They share DNA. <laughs> and he's, he's just saying, metaphorically speaking, yeah, yeah. Yeah. his brothers are Christians, go to church, things like that. But they're not all best friends and they, they can't speak into each other's lives. They would, several of them would just get really upset and it would just make things terrible. So everybody... You you can, but the goal is not to. Yeah, you have to be careful. Yeah, you tiptoe, you tiptoe yeah. around it. Yeah, but there you, there is always an opportunity because if somebody is in your life, there is always an opportunity. You know, because you do have something common. So don't ever write it off because oh, you, no. you know that's the thing. You know, God, God. You know, we just talked about the Holy Spirit. You know, I mean, we can think that you know. I mean, I have relatives, too, that I don't talk to because just the way they are, you know, I choose not to be around them because they're negative. But, you know, if if God prompts me or if I, you know, if I hear from them all of a sudden for some reason and they say something because they know where I stand. You know, it, it's still you're still you're still a role model, even if you're not in a daily or even, you know, annual, annual contact with somebody. Because like you said, you know, I mean, people come back and, you know, years later, you never know. And that's the beauty of teaching, right, Sean? The beauty of yep. teaching is you never know. I mean, kid comes to you 10 years from now and says, God, you made a difference in my life. And you think, what did I do? I don't even remember, you know? And, but it's just you being you, Sean. And that's, that's who, that's the most important thing you, God uses you as you. I think I took us off the track, Tim. Sorry. No, actually, actually, I think this is, this is that's perfect. It's, it, it's a, it's a track. I think we need to pause on a little bit because and I think, I think Sean is, you're, I'm echoing. So I'm echoing. Yeah. Um, I think Sean hit it. Is that you know, Mike is called for a specific purpose. Well, we're called for a specific purpose too. You know, we're called to you know, make disciples where, where wherever we go. We're we're called to do that. Um, but that that relationship that we're called to do is not is not necessarily a an evangelist role. Sometimes it's a counselor role. Sometimes it's a, a, a brother role. Sometimes it's a side by side, you know, have lunch on Thursdays and, and you know, talk about life. Um, it, and within that role, we do have authority uh, to speak. I think, I think that's what Sean's saying. Um, but there's, other, there's other opportunities as well that are, that are more tangential. The, the brother you see once a year or the, uh, the nephew that I've seen once in his life. <laughs> <laughs> that Cindy's referring to. Um, okay, well, let's let's go on to the next one. This is, um, I have no idea where I am. I have no idea where I left off. I was the last one, I think. Okay, so this would be the brand yeah. Now hear this, O leaders of the house of Jacob and rulers of the house of Israel, who despise justice and pervert all that is right, who build Zion with bloodshed and Jerusalem with iniquity. Uh, and this will be um, John. Her leaders judge for a bribe, her priests teach for a price, and her prophets practice divination for money yet they lean upon the lord saying is not the lord among us no disaster can come upon us <laughs> go ahead hmm. was that a was that a whoop abigail 
No? Okay. Yeah, so what, what causes the sense of invinci invincibility by the, the leaders, the priests, and the prophets, the three groups that are identified here? They want to be paid. Well, yeah. They, yeah, they're all doing it for money. But why do they think they're invincible? Why, why no das disaster can come upon us? They lean upon the Lord. Yeah. <laughs> the Lord's uh, with them. They think Abigail. they are who they are, where they are, because God put them there and they can do what they want right. in the name of God. Right. Right. They think they're doing what God wants them to do, but they're really doing for a bribe, for a price, and for money. There's nothing new under the sun. <laughs> <laughs> um, and this would be uh, Randy. Therefore, because of you, Zion will be plowed like a field. Jerusalem will become a hump. A, I'll try that again. Jerusalem will become a heap of rubble and the Temple Mount a wooded ridge. Therefore, because of you, it's your fault. And who is the you? The leaders. The leaders. Yeah, yeah. And then who suffers? The people. people. Yeah. Everybody. Yeah. 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 If you have if you have leadership role, that's some responsibility there in there. Oh yeah. Yeah. Um, Nancy. In the last days, the mountain of the house of the Lord will be established as a chief of the mountains. It will be raised above the hills and the peoples will stream to it. So what is Micah transitioning us here in this verse? The people's eyes are going to be open. Yeah, but there's something specifically that he's pointing to. I think the Lord's going to be doing something here. Mm-hmm. What will he be doing? It looks like he's got a house. Yeah. In the mountains. Let's, let's look at the first phrase. <laughs> the Lord is going to take over. <laughs> yeah, when, when will that happen? Last, Last day. Right. So this is the condition now. He's talking about the leadership and what's going to befall them, and, and it'll be plowed under. But in the last days, he's contrasting this. In the last days, the mountain of the house of the Lord will be established. So there will be a, a total restoration. God will do it, um, and, and that new Jerusalem will come, and it won't be ruled by injustice, and it won't be uh, ruled by pride, and it won't be ruled you know, by lack of mercy. It'll be ruled... By God Himself, as as that's what He's transitioning to. This is the contrast that that we have. We have the judgment, and now we roll into the contrast. Um, and uh, lookers. And many nations will come and say, "Come, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the, of the God of Jacob. He will teach us His ways, so that we may walk in His paths. For the law will go forth from Zion, and the word of the Lord." From Jerusalem. Again, this, this promise of, of, of a righteous nation, this new Jerusalem, uh, where the Lord himself um, teaches the people. And why will other nations stream to that kingdom? Because it's good. Yeah, exactly. It's good and right and just. Um, Cindy. Then he will judge many then he will judge between many people and arbitrate for strong nations far and wide. Then they will beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nation will no longer take up the sword against nation, nor will they train anymore for war. Reminds me of a song. Yeah. I'm going to study war no more. This, in, this, in this promised land where, where God will rule and he'll... He will judge between peoples. It'll be fair. It'll be just. It'll be equitable. And he will arbitrate conflict and he'll make that be resolved correctly. 
In that time, there'll be no need for war. In that time, there'll be no need for us to plan on how we take advantage of another people. In that time, there'll be peace. In that time, God will reign. So quite a contrast from, from the, the way he paints the, the leaders and the prophets and the priests um, in the current nation. This is uh, Harry and Chris. And each man will sit under his own vine and under his own fig tree with no one to frighten him for the mouth of the Lord of the hosts has spoken. Though each of the peoples may walk in the name of his, through each of the peoples may walk in the name of his God, yet he will walk in the name of the Lord our God forever and ever. Yeah, and again, he reiterates this promise of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, that we have this eternity with our God. Um, and, and he will bring it about. And it'll, it'll be just, it'll be fair, it'll be right. It'll be full of mercy, it'll be full of righteousness. And in that time, we will walk in his name for other people uh, forever and ever. Just a, just a wonderful promise. Um, and he continues. Uh, this is uh, Lord. On that day, declares the Lord, I will gather the lame, I will assemble the outcast, even those whom I have afflicted. And I will make the lame into a remnant and the outcast into a strong nation. Then the Lord will rule over them in Mount Zion from that day and forever. Again, this idea of gathering, gathering together, even those that have been judged, even those that have suffered because of others' judgment, he'll gather all of those uh, and make them a strong nation. Um, so in the, in the midst of judgments, there's this hope. And so when is this promise fulfilled? When you get to heaven, because it's sure not true here. Yeah, yeah, we're long. I think we're a long ways from it right now, yeah. from, from what, what we can observe. Yeah. So my notes say the Messianic period. Yeah. So they're saying when Jesus comes, right. this is true, even though it's not fully realized. It won't be fully realized until, you know, the last days, until the the New Jerusalem. Um, but we can enjoy that even now uh, because the king has already come. Um, did you just read that, Lori? No, I read the last one. Give me All this right. one. Want to read uh, it again? I'll no, read it. No, let's <laughs> go to the um, next one. All right, let's do John. I will read. And you. O watchtower of the flock, O stronghold of the daughter of Zion, the former dominion will be restored to you. Sovereignty will come to the daughter of Jerusalem. I'm gonna, I'm gonna stop on that verse. I thought I had a question there. Um, and so this is the end of the, this, this vision that he has for this future time when, uh, when God will restore when God will reign, it'll be just, it'll be fair, it'll be equitable. And then he finishes this with the people of Israel, that where the promises have come from Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. You know, that former dominion where, where you were in charge, that will be restored to you. And you will, um, um, you know, you will be watched over. You'll, you'll have um, strength and peace and all, all of those things. So it's not just the future, but it's also the nation itself will be restored. Um, and it is, um, you know, over the years, it gets, you know, after the Babylon captivity, it is brought back, it is restored um, as, a, as an example of what that future one will be. Okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stop there just because it's a good place to stop. Um, any other thoughts before we kind of do a little round of how we are doing? Okay, um, I, I feel like I'm really struggling with this um, myself. And I, I don't know, um, I would appreciate some feedback from y'all. Are, are you struggling with this too? Is this, is this a study that's not really relevant or should we continue on? What, what, are, what are your thoughts? Very relevant. Okay, so I got an okay from John. 
I mean, it's Bible study. So yes. what's bad about it? We're studying the Old Testament. So. And Jeff confirmed it on Sunday on his, his sermon. You know, he uh, he taught from the Habakkuk. So he's right. He's a little, he's a week ahead of you, but uh, he's there. I don't know how he does that. I don't I'm know telling you, I'm that. glad he checked in with you. <laughs> <laughs> I wish he would. He'd probably help me out a little bit. Uh, yeah, but you know, Tim, I think it's good. I mean, it is a hard study. It is. It, it brings up mm -hmm. some hard questions, I think, to all of us. But isn't that how we grow? You know, it's we're learning stuff that, you know, we don't want to really know. But, it, you know, it's I think it's, it helps us to grow when, when it's hard like this. You know, it really it's a lot of deep feelings when we're discussing this stuff, mm -hmm. you know. Our culture is all about, don't judge me, don't judge me, you know, and you know, I just had this conversation a week ago with my kids and I said, yeah, you are supposed to judge. You are supposed to look at something and decide whether it's right or wrong for you, whether that's a good friendship or a bad friendship, whether you should eat that or not. It's all judgment. We're not supposed to well, condemn yeah. other people, but judge, it's, it's part of life. And our culture doesn't like it because it implies that there is a right and wrong. Um, but judgment is part of God's character. So it's important that we know it um, and are aware of it. Yeah, I have a question on this verse. It says the stronghold of the daughter of Zion. Who's the daughter of Zion and who's the daughter of Jerusalem? I was just getting ready to Google that. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, what'd you come up with? <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm going to wait for my Bible note readers. Um, I, my, my guess is it's it's the nation of Israel. It is. A daughter yeah. is a people waiting to be saved. Yeah. It's oh, talking about, okay. the, it's a personification of Jerusalem. Am I saying so yeah, We're not talking about Jerusalem as Jerusalem in today's world. We're talking about the daughter of Jerusalem. Right. Not a child, mm. not a son, but the daughter. It says, it says when they're waiting to be saved, the damsel in distress. Jeez. Well, could it not be like the daughter, like the bride, because this is the bride, the bride to the bridegroom, right? The Messiah is the is the groom, and well, Zion's the mountain, Jerusalem's the city. Right. So the and daughter, the, the, the Christian daughter church, is the bride. The right. church is the bride of Christ, right. not the Jewish nation. Right, right. Okay, for homework, we'll, fi we'll figure out. We'll, st <laughs> we'll start here next week. And we'll figure out what the Nancy, we need Nancy. Nancy can give us any input. She's the wisdom one. I'm not wisdom. I just, I just read my notes, my footnotes. <laughs> I have no wisdom. All right. I'll, I'll look at some commentary. We'll, we'll start there next week. So, um, well, what, what, uh, as we finish this in prayer, what, what can we be praying about for each of you or for something that's on your mind? For Cindy and I, um, I think it's really a prayer of gratitude. Um, I mean, we're very blessed this this uh, last couple of weeks with the two babies and everybody's healthy and uh, so all in all just we're just filled with gratitude so that's just did you have the second one uh yeah my daughter katie had uh, her second one on thanksgiving day oh, oh. I didn't see, oh. you didn't see any pictures facebook yeah. <laughs> i have gone anti-facebook for a while I try to stay off of that. And Patty, we're gonna. Well, congratulations anyway, Tim and Cindy. Yes, thank you. I think Patty, oh, that... Patty I, I guess we, uh, you need some uh, healing and comfort in your back. I do, I, it, I'll, I'll get better. Just take a while. Yeah. Thank you. I think I think she is doing some better with her heart and her anxiety issues, but 
now it's just moved on to the back. So well, he did. My doctor did determine that where my heart is skipping, the bottom of my heart is uh, I there would shouldn't be any stroke issues. So I was thankful to hear that. I think yeah. that was my biggest concern. Okay. I have a praise. Um, yesterday, um, actually on Saturday night, our music minister called me and indicated that uh, he had been uh, exposed to someone with COVID. And so he was trying desperately to get a, a test done, but could not get anything done over the weekend. And so Saturday evening, I was asked to lead worship with actually with his wife um, on Sunday morning. And I was to do a special song as well. And it, it all turned out as Jesus would have it turn out. Uh, mm -hmm. God was there and, and blessed the service. And uh, um, Matt Proctor, who is the president of uh, Ozark. Ozark Bible College, um, spoke at the service yesterday, and uh, it all turned out well. It was a, it was a, it was a praise, okay. and he got tested today and was negative. So, excellent. We probably should keep Donna Burke in our prayers. She's had her second chemo, and uh, after the first couple of days where the steroids, you know, are working well, she she plummets a bit. So. How's oh, Bob? Marianne. How's Bob? Oh. Marianne. Marianne's How's Marianne? recovering from this. She thought she had COVID, but it ended up being a, a flu, the flu, stomach flu instead. So praise the Lord there, but she still needs our prayers. She's still very weak too. How's Bob O'Blenis doing? Does anybody know? Uh, I sent him a note uh, last week and... Um, uh, he said it was a particularly bad day, um, so I think there's still issues, and he's not uh, not healing as expected. He had to wait until Monday to talk to the the doctor that he's going to, so that, mm -hmm. that waiting was hard. So he he might hear something uh, today and kind of have a next step to take. Are the Murphys back at church? Yeah, yeah. 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 They came back on Sunday. Oh, good. I know our, our church family is so important to us. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, I will be happy to close it out if uh, someone will start. <clears throat> Dear God, thank you for all the